Hello and welcome to episode 101 of the Mark and Me podcast. As always, I'm your host Mark. Now joining me on today's episode, in my opinion, is the best songwriter we have in this country. He fronted my favourite band of all time, Ruben. So yes, today I'm joined by the absolutely awesome Jamie Lemon. This is a guest that isn't new to Mark and me, and a couple of years ago he came on. It was one of those episodes I think that was my most downloaded at the time and got a lot of interest in music fans and made me want to then invest more time in bands and get loads of bands on like Fries, etc. So it opened the doors to a lot more and I'm absolutely thrilled that he's back today to talk about his brand new album, which in my opinion is the album of the year or mini album of the year, King of Clubs. But before we get into that, let's touch base and talk about the last episode. I was joined by the absolutely amazing Ed Solomon. This was a huge occasion for me to celebrate episode 100 and he really was the perfect guest and I knew it from the response that I got from you guys out there. I saw so many tweets and Facebook comments saying how much they enjoyed the interview, how inspired they felt by it and it's just been amazing to see Ed responding to people on Twitter and really appreciated all the amazing feedback that you guys gave us. But let's get back into today's episode. I'm joined by the incredible Jamie Lemon. So let's hear it now. Here's me and Jamie talking all things music. Okay, so Jamie, thanks for coming back and joining me on the Mark and Me podcast. Thou art welcome, Mark and you. Well, well, dude, first of all, I'm going to have to get a court case against you because two years ago, I was sat with you talking about possible albums that could come out. And we talked yeah. about cover albums or yes. stuff that's <laughs> like B-sides. Yeah. Six months after I left your house, you released Shuffle. Yeah. I believe that you owe me some royalties or something for that because I planted that seed and said you should just bring out an album of covers. Was it? Would I have? Would I have already <laughs> by the time? Because we did it uh, in January and then it came out in July. Maybe we spoke just before it happened. Yeah, I'll send you some royalties or at least a copy. I think you That's deserve fair. a copy. Yeah, I've got a few copies you can have. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I don't know. I can't remember the ins and outs of that chat, but as um, as I told everyone at the time in a slightly defensive way. It had been my plan for a long time to do um, a covers record, and it wasn't just because I didn't have any material. I'd been sort of fighting for my right to cover since before Muscle Memory. I thought, I thought maybe that was a good way to reintroduce myself before Muscle Memory started happening. I could do an album covers. And in fact, I wanted to do Back With The Band. We were talking of doing about uh, an EP of covers that would have been cool at one point between the second and third records. Again, not because we didn't have any material, just because we loved other people's songs and we loved the whole music sphere. So along with Muscle Memory, which, which is again, a crazy concept that I've had for a long time, that second concept album, Shuffle, that, that concept had been kicking around in my brain for a while. So um, you're now you're not getting a copy at all. I've just talked myself oh, wow. out of it. Sorry. Just one? One small copy? That seems fair. Maybe half a copy. I'm going to sand off the, the side <laughs> And I send you the record with a completely flat side B. How's that? You can have half a copy. When Shuffle came out, I wasn't expecting it to be like that. I expected it to be more like when you did stuff like Nine Inch Nails covers at live Radio 1 sessions and stuff like that. I didn't expect you to do the Popeye theme and stuff like that. Shame on you. Oh, ye of little face. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I think there's definitely, a, there's definitely um, different pockets for different types of covers. Yeah. So, for instance, yeah, when you go in on a radio session... The fun of doing covers at a radio session is for, you know, when we did that Nine Inch Nails cover for three guys. And later when I did a radio session for Radio X around Devolver, again, there was only three of us to try and recreate with three players the intricacies of a record like Hand That Feeds or of Material Girl, you know. Um, so that's its own distinct fun because there are limitations. And in that instance, the challenge is to make it sound as close to the original as you can with what you got. Whereas, and we did it with um, Feel Good Inc. as well. Yeah. Whereas on a record, if you have no limitations in terms of players or sounds or textures, the challenge then becomes how different can we make it? So I like them both. And I still would like to do, you know, whenever I next go in for a radio session, God knows when that will be, I've got some ideas of some covers that would be fun to do to try and get it as close to the original rather than tear it apart like I did on Shuffle. So I have fun with both. Anything that you can reveal that could be a possible cover that could tease the people listening? Every every single day I hear a song and I'm like, oh my God, I got to cover that. And I remember 
how thin the public's uh, patience has been stretched with the entire record. And I think of holding back. It's it's difficult because because um, although there's lots of songs that I would like to cover, they're they're usually much more in the sort of the first instance, the Radio One, uh, Radio X live format thing, where you just the challenge is to do it with you, two or three players. Whereas it's quite it's a lot rarer where I have a song that I want to completely pull apart and put back together. And that's why everything that was on shuffle was that, you know, I've been thinking about doing it in some instances since I was 12, you know, I wanted to do the Wolverine soundtrack since I was 12. That takes a lot longer. So in terms of a shuffle two, lots of people have asked me about a shuffle two. If that record happens, it will be a long time coming because at yet, I can't think of any tracks that, you know, I've loved for so long. I sort of got it all out of my system in terms of complete reinventions. But in terms of like fun covers at a festival or whatnot, yeah, there's lots. I'm, I'm not giving you any clues because anything I say now will be superseded. I could tell you what my current hot squeeze is. And then by next week, I'll have heard something else and go, oh, it's got to be that. So lots of exciting ideas. Um, but I, I'm, not, I'm staying tight-lipped, sorry. I don't believe you either because you're saying right now that like a shuffle volume two would be a long way off. Yes. We're talking about it right now on this podcast, which means you'll fucking release it in like three months and it'll be like, shuffle two. <laughs> Who can say? Who could say? I mean, what I can tell you is that I've got a lot more projects um, in the pipeline that are, are more pressing than shuffle two. So purely by weight of material, shuffle two would, would have to wait. Uh, so it won't be within three months. I can guarantee within three months. Can I? God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> it's already recorded. <laughs> yeah, sorry, yeah. And talking about singing other people's songs, something that I wanted to talk to you about at the time, but waited until now, was you got to fill in for Black Peaks when Will wasn't very well. And that's mm. a hell of a job to have to do. And you pulled it off pretty damn well, my friend. Thank you. Were you there at ATG? Well, unfortunately, I couldn't get there. I had to work. But what I did do is someone was there filming it on their phone. And normally oh, stuff on the phone sounds terrible, but it sounded <laughs> fucking awesome. So I was like, wow. Good. Good, yeah. Yeah, they were very big boots to fill, but I mean, I sort of, although um, I admire Will um, hugely, hugely, uh, and I would say, because Will is an actual singer, whereas I'm a guitarist who sings, and they're not the same things at all. Um, so I would say, without a doubt, that Will factually is a better singer than me. But, and yet, I think if you look at what we both do with our voices, we're actually very similar. We've ended up similar. I'm not sure that Will was um, influenced by my work uh, when he started singing. And certainly I've been influenced by Will since I met them. But before then, I sort of came up with my own thing. What I'm trying to say is that whether incidentally or not, we've ended up with quite similar styles. So even though um, he is, as far as I'm concerned, like a golden god of singing, I was quite confident that if anyone could do it, I could. I thought that was a good match. Yeah, you know, if, I wasn't, if I wasn't me and I had to pick a replacement singer for Black Peaks, I would have picked me. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I went into it feeling very confident. And obviously, because I know the other boys, I know all of them very well. And the fact that I knew Will as well, because that must have been a hard pill to swallow. I mean, Will doesn't have a big ego at all. I think he's got an ego at all. Um, God knows I do. But um, he didn't seem to have any uh, sticky feelings about me playing the show for him and they even we even did a t-shirt with me on and without will on which i thought was a little bit cripes but then he did a video for my single wearing that t-shirt which just shows you what a big person he is um so yeah it was wonderful it was i mean there was lots of feelings because it was a great opportunity and to play excellent music that I loved with my good friends is sublime. But the only reason we were doing it was because our other friend was like in serious medical trouble. Yeah. So we were all worried and frightened and sad that he wasn't there at the same time as being elated and overjoyed and filled with um, this music. So it was a, a quite a cocktail of emotions. Yeah, it's uh, they look, they seem to be like the cursed band where every time they announce a tour, something would go wrong or they couldn't do this and his health and everything. I just hope that like next year they get to finally come back and just show the world why they're one of the best bands on the planet. They are. Yeah, it was just a bad run of bad luck. No, no more than that. I think I was going to say, yeah. that, but that doesn't sound quite right. <laughs> you know, yeah. No, I was thrilled to do it, but I'm I'm even more thrilled that I don't have to do it again. You know. That's fair. And you were talking then about um, 
other singers and bands and stuff like that. And I recently had Jen on from False Advertising. Oh, yeah. She loves you a lot. And you, <laughs> you influenced her a lot. And oh, we great. sat She's talked. great. That's great to know. Oh, man. We talked about you for a lot. And then only a few, <laughs> weeks, only a few weeks later, she did the whole of Race Cars, Race Car Backwards on the piano and sang. Yes, yeah, she did. How good was that? That's really cool. She'd actually, she sent me previously, because we talk quite a lot on emails. One of the things that I, I really gets my goat is if you go on tour with someone, you get to know someone, and, and then after the tour or whatever, you never speak again. And, and you become such good friends on the road, and it breaks my heart when those relationships don't follow on. So I make quite an effort to keep up with people. And I'm proud to say that most of the people that I've been on tour with, certainly since I've been a, a solo act on my own, I'm still in fairly regular contact with, and Jen's very good at that. Every now and then, one of us will say, hey, how you doing, and fill each other in on what we've been doing. And she'd sent me, she'd sent me some recordings she'd made back when she was a kid, when she originally, when that record first came out, that she'd sort of learnt her own versions on piano. And I loved, and I said, you've got to put this out. People will love it. And so then when she did uh, the live session for Trees, that was, I think that was a culmination of that. It was really great, and people really responded. And um, I'm fond of saying that, you know, it never really sounds like a real song. My own songs don't sound like real songs to me until someone else plays them. Yeah. Because all I can hear is my potato voice or my, like, shit guitar playing. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, all the bits that I hate off the records. So to hear someone else do them is always magic. And then when it's, like, a personal friend and someone as great as Jen and also someone that's done their own interpretation interpretation. It was just wonderful. She's, I mean, she's really great to say that I've influenced her is, is just the biggest compliment because I love what she's doing anyway. I love what she was doing independently of, of our relationship. Even before we'd met, I love force advertising and I thought these guys are fucking great. And then for her to say things like, Oh, well, you know, I took a lot of it from you. It's just, it, it's magic, you know? That's really good. And it seems so weird now to be talking about touring and stuff, but just before all this lockdown happened and you were getting to tour and play lots of shows, you went and teased the whole internet by taking photos of you and Guy again. And that got a lot of people going, oh, Ruben are back. Why was that? How was that a tease? In what well, regard was that I a tease? I saw lots of people on forums on Facebook saying, have you seen there's photos of Guy playing drums with Jamie again? Ruben are going to agree touring. Well, yeah, but I mean, that's their fucking fault. I've only been saying <laughs> for 12 fucking years that it happened. You would have thought it would be clear enough by now. And I see Guy and John, you know, regularly. Guy a lot more because he lives very close to me. John not so much because he lives in Manchester. And um, actually, do you know what? Do you know what? We were all in... You said we were going to talk about Ruben... We were all in the last time I saw John was when Guy and I were rehearsing for Road to Lemania and we had all our gear set up in the room. And then John was rehearsing in the other room with another one of his bands just before he moved to Manchester. And he came in and Guy said, let's get a picture of all of us <laughs> in the <laughs> old room where we used to rehearse. And all the gear was there. And I was like, no, because the internet will just go inside out. Don't do that to everyone. <laughs> I thought that would have been a bridge too far. But yeah, I mean, what am I supposed to do? You know, I want to play drums with Guy. I needed a drummer. Guy was free. Uh, and, you know, we take pictures all the time of everything we do now for the internet. So I was going to have to take a picture of us together at some point. I couldn't just keep him like the masked drummer the whole time. People would have worked it out from the height ratio who he yeah. was. Who's that <laughs> little boy wearing a sack on his head? Yeah. You know, maybe, I don't know. But this is the thing that makes me a little bit cross is that people, I think people think, you know, if only we could get in the same room, then we just automatically bring up back the band because they assume we're all worst enemies. Whereas again, as I've said many thousands of times, nothing could be further from the truth. You know, we're all very good friends. Um, so. I think people assume, oh, well, if they, if they can stand to be in the same room, then a reunion must be around the corner. But no, not, not interested. Guy, I mean, guy, the other two are even less interested than me, and I'm pretty uninterested. <laughs> they were, uh, I was doing a... Because Guy didn't play Trees with me last year, but he came along. He had a day ticket anyway. <laughs> and then I was playing it with Chris Rouse, who was another... A uh, big Ruben guy. He was our he was guy's drum tech for years, um, and then I was doing a big um, the press junket in the press bit, 
And I just got to the bit in every interview where the interviewer asked me, when are Ruben getting back together? And I said, I don't fucking know, man. And I looked over to my right and there was Guy who just happened to be walking past. And I said, hey, Guy, when's Ruben getting back together? And he said, tomorrow. <laughs> and then just <laughs> left. <laughs> and I think the dude thought he had an exclusive, but no, 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 sorry. That's fair. And now that we are in lockdown and shows aren't happening as much, we will talk about the shows you've recently done, but obviously you've probably got a bit more time on your hands and stuff like that. I know yeah. you've been doing quite a lot more artwork again. I've been seeing you doing like a lot of sort of classic film prints and stuff like this. And I even bought yeah. a Slimer one from you. I thought it was fucking great. Oh, yes, you did, didn't you? Yes, yeah, that's right. I Sorry, I sold so many of them that the, the words... The words on the envelopes went into a blur, but I did notice it was your name on there. Did I put a little message in there for you? No. You thought, oh, I'm so sorry. Maybe I had a run of them that day. Yeah, that got um, that was really useful because at the start of lockdown, I'd been neglecting yeah my artwork for a long for a long time, and certainly uh, in 2019, it didn't get a look in because I was doing shuffle all year. And then when the year by the time the year finished, I was already working on King of Clubs. Um, so it didn't, I didn't get a lot of looking to do um, lots of cartooning, should we say. So when lockdown happened and suddenly no one had anything to do, yeah, I thought, what am I going to fucking do? <laughs> and so I drew a little picture of Slimer and he was the first one. Um, and then I put it on my Instagram and it got a big response. And then people started asking for prints. And I thought, oh, well, I might as well make some prints because I got like a nice printer and some nice paper. Uh, and then I, I sort of, I'd set myself a little task of trying to do one every other day or every few days of a little, just a little, the mascot characters from those 80s cartoons and properties, the little non-speaking yeah. little weird animal things. Oh, slime as a ghost, but you know what I mean? Um, that was fun. It just kept me busy. It, it kept the spark going because I'm sure, like everyone else, I had some days where I thought, why am I even fucking getting out of bed, you know? And that just became a reason to get out of bed, to get me over the initial hump of um uselessness it was really helpful and people's reaction to them were was really wonderful to have a conversation and you know all those things that we can lovely happy memories of when we weren't uh, in a plague um and yeah you know i made a bit of dosh it was good selling the prints you know i tried to keep them real cheap but i sold so many that you know it helped pay the rent for maybe like a month <laughs> that was great since uh, all my other forms of um income had been taken away well my main form of income which is music so yeah, it was it was great to keep me alive as an artist and to resurrect that cartoonist bit of myself that hadn't seen much use in a while, but also to connect with people and um, plus all of that, yeah, earn a little bit of money on the side was great. It was good. It was nice, cheap. If you wanted the original, it wasn't like you had to completely like remortgage your house. It was a good price. And then also no, because they were only I only did them in pencil anyway. You know, yeah. like they look like, cool. Like, if you want an original, it's you have that framed on your wall for only a hundred or one hundred and fifty quid. That's that's pretty damn good. It, well, it was yes. Lots of people people send me photos of them framed up, and it's nice to see the original. You know, as an art collector myself, it's the same with when I put out a record. I always think, what what would I like as a record collector myself? And so. Similarly, as an art collector, I think, well, I'd fucking like, you know, the pence and original. That'd be fucking cool. And especially if it's only, you know, tens of pounds or whatever. Yeah. And put it in a frame. I'd, I'd like, and I have a lot of originals myself. So, yeah, I always try and think of what I would like. And it uh, turns out people agree with me. And are you going to keep that going? I see you've had, like, people ask to draw their dogs and cats and animals and stuff. But are you going to keep on doing requests and bringing out, like, sort of nostalgia TV designs? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I sort of, I, I, when I decided I was going to do a series of those little um, mascot creatures, I decided it was going to be a limited thing and I wouldn't really like scrape the barrel because there's only so many before you get to like Sooty. Is Sooty <laughs> really one of them, you know? Yeah. Uh, but, uh, so I've, I think I finished doing the mascots, but it did, like you say, it did spin on into, I started doing portrait people's said, well, you draw my dog? And I was like, okay. <laughs> and then I did quite a few of them. And I actually found myself really enjoying them because I'm an animal lover. And the photo, you know, the reference photos that people would send of their pets, which with the idea of, you know, trying to get their personalities across, they really did. It's just photos of these stupid gormless cats with their favorite mouse toy or whatever. I go absolutely crazy about all that shit. And, and it's so, and people's pets are so important to people. And a couple of people asked for, for portraits of pets that had died. And so 
I could tell it meant a lot to them to really get the personality. And I regarded that as quite a, a, a deep responsibility. It sounds silly, but so I really enjoyed doing the pet portraits. And then I got a couple of really great commissions. Someone asked me to draw all four turtles, which I would have done for free. I didn't yeah. tell him that, but that was a great commission to get. And I drew, um, we were talking about Jaws. I did a great Jaws commission for someone who just wanted, um, we were talking about it. And I said, why don't we have all the main characters inside the shark as if they all got eaten in the end. And he said, that's great. And I, I, I spent a bit more time on that than I usually would have. And it was very satisfying. So yeah, I would really like to do more of that. I don't think I'm going to do more of the mascots, but if you commission me and you can commission me, anyone who's listening, hello at jamielemon.com. Yeah, I'll draw whatever you want and pop culture. That's why everyone loves pop culture stuff. I did a Danger Mouse. That was fucking great. So I've really enjoyed doing them. Yeah, the commissions have been great. Jaws is my favourite film of all time, and every time I see anyone oh. try and do a design or a post or something, I was like, "Yours was completely different. It wasn't just the the ocean with the whole shark coming up. It was Ace. I loved it. I love the fact that they were inside the shark. I was like, oh, that's a better concept that I haven't seen before. I'm glad, and I'm really glad that the guy that commissioned it took the risk because a lot of the time when you get commissions, people know what they want and they just want they don't want any mucking around or clever artistic ideas whereas this guy was really receptive and it was incredibly fulfilling and it, and it came out you know the piece speaks for itself i'm glad you liked it man oh it's awesome and when you have been able to play a few shows i've noticed recently you did a I think three nights at the signature brewery house and yes. i like the little term of lemonade i thought that was genius well, yeah, I can't take credit for that one. That was a popular um, schoolyard uh, cuss that was thrown my way at school. I suffer from an all of, a lot of uh, citrus-based jokes at primary school. So to, to finally own Lemonade felt really good. And it tasted good too. Yeah, the Signature Brew shows were, were really great. They sort of came out of nowhere and uh, ended up being the highlight of the summer. But you're kind of like one of the first artists out there right now that kind of just went, look, we can do this if there's a few benches and there's a certain distance between anyone and I can still stand on stage and not infect anyone and everyone seems to be having a good time. It was like, oh, we might help to actually start to see bands and people perform again. Yeah, I didn't, like I said, I, I made a, a post, a couple, uh, I think last week about how I read a review of it. Someone did a review of it and it was only when I read the review that I realised, oh shit, actually it was quite important, you know, to to make that step to, to really try to be one of these people like Frank who did the yeah. indoor a, a few weeks ago to really try and let's see how we could make this work. I think the, the, the outcome of Frank's gig was that it wasn't really viable in an indoor venue with spacing that much. And it, it just wouldn't have made enough money to um, even without paying the ax to, to work. But I think the signature brew one, cause it was outside and we can get just enough people. Uh, I think it worked, you know, I think we, we it covered it covered all the costs and everyone had a great time and no one got the lurgy. I don't think. I haven't had the reports back. There's been a spike. I went on the news just before this interview and there's been a slight spike, but in Wales. So I think you're all right. Okay, thank God. Yeah, I don't know which direction the wind was blowing. But um, yeah, it felt it really good. And, I, and, you know, when I accepted, I just thought, hey, great, a gig. And I didn't consider that actually we were, we were part of um, a wider effort to bring music back. So I'm very... Um, humbled and proud that St. Chibu asked me. They could have asked anyone. It was their gig. It was their idea. They said, would you like to play? So I can't claim any credit for putting the whole thing together. And I, I feel very lucky to have been chosen. I think the surname has a lot to do it because you couldn't do like Deftones well, or, yeah. or, you know, Pearl Jam Age. It doesn't work. I was talking to Frank about if he did one, what drink he would do. And I came up with Drank Turner, which oh. I'm quite proud of. That's yeah, awesome. I don't know if he's going to do it. Yeah, I drank Turner. There you go. That'll be announced next week now. Yeah. Well, yeah, and I'll get my percentage on it. I'll get to send me a couple of milli milliliters. And as we're sitting here, it's very close now to the release of your new mini album. So close. I got them this morning in the post. I got the records in a big box and so fucking exciting. That's Christmas Day for any... Um, musician is opening a box of your new record unbelievable yeah. and we've got the gold record there it looks fucking <laughs> sick can we swear on this of course we can we can say what the oh, fuck we want man it is it's just excellent and the cd actually i really i think my favorite bit of it is the cd i quite like little small compacty versions and uh i've just been uh, ogling that all day the three different versions the 
stand of honor, the gold vinyl and the CD was so exciting for me. So let's talk about, I know it looks good, but it actually sounds good. And I've had the album, I think we said this just off air, but I've had the album for a couple of months and I forget sometimes oh. that when you get to do these podcasts, you get these little sort of perks. And I, do. I forget that other people haven't got it. So I'm I forget sat there and I'm like, oh man, track two is unreal. And they're like, what do you mean? I'm like, I mean, uh, you know, oh. it's... Uh, it's only three months away, but truthfully, and I'm not just saying this, I believe it's the best thing you've ever put out. <laughs> oh, wow. I do. You, you wouldn't believe how many people have said that. I'm quite shocked. My old manager, Barney, who used to manage Ruben, came I know by. Barney. Oh, you know Barney? I met Barney many times. You, you know, you should interview him on one of these because he's got lots of stories. He's yeah. doing some amazing stuff now. And of course, he um, managed Ruben for all those years. And before then, he was uh, TMing for lots of great bands. You should get him on. He came over, you know, and he's, always, he's one of the people I play it to first, you know. And I think halfway through, he said, this is your best album. This is the best thing you've ever done. And I thought, wow, fuck. <laughs> it's only a mini album. And quite a few people have said similar things. And I'm very glad to hear you say it because obviously I, I respect your opinion. Oh, it's a nice thing for anyone to say, but slowly but surely, lots of people have come out and said, this is your best one, which is great. Yeah. I didn't expect it to be. I didn't even expect to make an album. I was supposed to be making a single, but out, out it comes. And uh, yeah, I'm very, very excited for people to hear it. Thank you. Wow. Now I'm even more excited. It is. It's like Race Cars, Race Car Backwards is my favorite album of all time. Like it's that or <laughs> Jeff Buffy, like that and Jeff Buffy Grace. There's like, there's just something. Get like out of town. It's those two. You know this, man. Twin and Pillar Society, fuck. I know. And this, for me, has topped it. I think, I don't know. It's just, there's no, you never want to... Can I get that on a quote? Can you say, this is better than Race Cars, Race Car Backwards, and then I can put it on the album things? Yeah, of course. Say, just say it now for me. I believe this is better than Race Cars, Race Car Backwards. That's going straight on the poster. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> wow. I do that. Know. It's... it's it I don't know what it is. It's, it's just perfect. Maybe less is more sometimes. Like, I don't know. I think I was a bit like, oh, is there only that many tracks? I want like 15 again. I want to be spoiled yeah. and have loads. But if every single song is brilliant and you don't want to have to skip any tracks and it just flows mm -hmm. perfectly, I'm pretty happy yeah, with wow. just that little runtime. I'm like, yep, yeah, that's great. I'm happy. It's, it's done the job and it's everything I wanted. Well, I'm glad, man. I, I think um, the less is more approach was key to its creation. You know, I've said a couple of times that I, very, I didn't know what I wanted to do quite, but I knew that I didn't want to make another whole, another full length. Yeah. Uh, Shuffle, because Shuffle was so big. Uh, I don't think Shuffle's actually particularly long, maybe 40, 45 minutes, but it's certainly big in terms of its breadth and its scope. And so to put out another full length would have been a big mistake. So I, I very definitely, I pulled up on the reins before, you know, we could have spent weeks in the studio and we could have come up with, you know, 10, 12 tracks, but perhaps it would have, there wouldn't have been any filler on any of my records, I hope not, but um, we would have run that risk. Whereas knowing when to quit while you're ahead, I fancy has always been one of my um, best qualities, maybe one of my only qualities. And, uh, yeah, knowing that this should just be a mini album rather than a full length there, I think was a crucial decision. And also the decision to, to upgrade it from an EP because it was going to be just a four track thing. Yeah. When I decided, actually, do you know what? If we just had a couple more tracks to play with, we could really do something that was layered and fulfilling and satisfying. And I'm glad, I'm glad um, we made that decision. Yeah, so just we just spun it right. I'm so relieved, yeah. And what about the production wise? Because this is the last time we're going to say the word Ruben on this interview. Okay. If we say it again, <laughs> just hang up. Yeah. Yeah, but when sure. I sat in your house and we talked about very fast, very dangerous, you didn't like the sound. It was too polished. It wasn't raw enough. It wasn't the sound of the album that you wanted. Hmm. Well, that was, that was always what I thought about all the Ruben records until yeah. we made the trust, which finally was as raw as I wanted. That's why that's my favorite record. It had this, it had the sound that I wanted. Yeah. Has, has this for you got the sound that you wanted? Because I think this sounds the most like what it'll sound like when I go and see you live. 
I think when I get to finally go out and see bands again and you play these songs, it will sound like this does on record. I think that's what I love about this. It's raw, it's it's dirty, but it also sounds fucking professional. <laughs> Thanks. These are all quite still good on the poster. I um, Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure about how it... Um, how it will translate live. Well, actually I have been rehearsing it with Jacko, uh, my drummer, um, one of my many drummers, uh, for a live stream we're gonna do on the weekend it comes out. So I have actually started translating it live and it, yeah, it sounds great. I, that wasn't part of my thinking when, I, when we went into the studio. I knew I wanted it to sound, we, we focused a lot more on the sounds than we have on previous albums which is not to say that we weren't focused on sounds before but i feel like this is an this is an album for producers for sound heads who like that kind of thing we and we made a very conscious effort i don't know if you've read the press release but we came up with this word nasty which mm. is the perfect mix of nasty and nice so we want it to sound horrible but that you like it and in yeah. fact that's the theme that runs through the record something that's horrible but you like it one of the one of the songs like me better is about someone that initially you find repulsive and then you through weeks or maybe even months of thinking about it you realize that actually you're in love with it <laughs> and that's what i that's what i hope this is well i hope you love it straight away but even if it takes you a while you're gonna love it sooner or later yeah that's the same with broccoli well i haven't got there yet but i spoke to my my tour manager jerry bryant I saw him the other day at the rehearsal studios because he owns the rehearsal studios and he was chowing down a broccoli. He fucking loves broccoli. Yeah. So, <laughs> he hasn't me yet, but hopefully I'll get there. I never used to like olives and now I can't get enough. So maybe. Yeah. I've only just recently had olives at uh, Pizza Express. I mean, other pizza oh. places are available, but um, yeah. they brought them out and I thought I'll try one. I was like, Oh, I'm not going to like this. And for some reason it wasn't the best tasting thing. I can't describe the taste, but I like them and kept eating them. I want more. There you go. That's what this is all about. Yeah, that's my record. It's olives and broccoli. Yeah, you can put that. That's you know. I just want to see a poster with my quotes. <laughs> I'm filling them up. I'm writing them down here, man. Better than race cars, race car backwards. It's like olives. You just keep wanting more, but you don't know why. Yes, lovely. Um, wow. Uh, sounds really dirty and raw, but done pretty well. Professionally. Sounds yeah, professionally. Yeah. <laughs> I want the stamp of professionalism, yeah, that's what I'm yearning for. And what's the future looking like? Because obviously this album will be out when people are listening to this, but then I've seen you've been announced for Download Festival next year. That lineup is pretty damn good. It, well, it always is a downer, isn't it? They get what they fucking want. I think I heard the other day that it's the, it's the second largest festival after Glastonbury in the UK, which is fucking crazy. That is mad. But yeah, they um, you to be on the poster with Gajira and Deftones and... Mastodon and all these bands. I was like, yeah, that's awesome. It's going to be great. I'm really looking forward to, I mean, that's the, the first thing in the calendar officially now. So beyond my little live stream at the end of uh, this month, that's really where I will set my sights. Uh, there's rumblings of other stuff going on, but nothing is confirmed. But download is the big stake in the ground. And, you know, I'm really really looking forward to it in a way that I haven't looked forward to anything for quite some time. So, yeah. And I feel like, you know, I've got a history with downloads and I really like to go and play. I never, I'm never sure if I am specifically a download band, you know, I think maybe in the year we played it when I brought out muscle memory and I played an entire set of just the dirtiest, heaviest bullshit you could imagine. Then I was a download band. Then I was really heavy. Um, but now I'm not sure. And I, I, that just makes me happy, even happy that they booked me because it shows that you just got to be a, a good band, let alone, um, you know, a download band or whatever to play. Uh, I'd just always happy to go back there. Yeah. But I also put bands like Biffy Claro. Are they a download band? And they're fucking headlining. Yes, they are. I spoke to Simon about that. Yeah. <laughs> headlining over the Deftones. I mean, <laughs> that's, that's crazy. That's crazy. Biffy are a download. Band. I remember when we did the main stage at Download and we went to see them headlining the second stage just after Puzzle came out. In fact, that's when, just as Puzzle came out, I hadn't got a copy and we went to see them and they gave us copies, which was nice. That was, um, 
And it was the last was the Lampe Figue Garçon. I can't remember. No, it can't have been. But I remember it uh, clearly because it was lovely because Billy Talent were also there. That last year when um, we did download on the message, it was a great year. Lots of buddies there and Biffy were there. So I always sort of link Biffy with um, download for some reason. Yeah, they're definitely a download band. I was there, man, and you made all the crowd do a pogo about 12 o'clock in the afternoon and everyone was doing the like pogo dance. Yeah, on hangover morning. That was that's, tough. It was like a really? Sunday morning. I was so hungover. I'm like, Ruben on the main stage. Fuck, that's us yeah. And I was like, really? I was pretty happy with that. You can sort of see on the video that at the start, there wasn't many people there. And then by the end, there was quite a lot of people. So job done. It was awesome. You can say you played the main stage at Download. I was saying it before I did. I <laughs> yeah. Yeah, sure. And what are you listening to at the moment? Like last time you came on, you're talking about bands and people were then like, oh, I love the fact that you get people to like recommend stuff. What sort of bands are out there right now that people should be checking out? Well, um, I tell you what I can't stop listening to is the new two songs from Rubber Bandits. I've been going on about Rubber Bandits for a long time. Or maybe I haven't been going on about them. Uh, they're like, if you don't know, they're sort of a comedy duo from Ireland, but they also make like incredibly insightful brilliant music they sort of started out making like comedy records and comedy songs which are very funny but still good music like sort of flight the concords maybe it's still a good song even though it's funny and now they've sort of started they've gone on a darker trip and they're just making like really mind-blowing um songs that really say something about society with a sort of still with a sort of pinch of dark humor and they make their own videos and one of the guys is like a, a vfx specialist um sfx specialist sorry and they got two new tracks one of them's called dancing which is pretty straightforward but still a great groove and then one of them's called bertie ahern about the disgraced irish um Tassioc, or I, I think that's how it pronounced they're the irish prime minister i uh, it just has to be seen and heard to be believed so check out the two new tracks um by rubber band it's definitely that's the newest thing i'm into jimothy lacoste's latest stuff is also very good uh, he, um, I don't know if you know Jimothy Lacoste, he's a big YouTube guy. Um, he's bringing out these sort of very um, monotone, under understated delivery, uh, sort of, I suppose it's R&B type stuff. But he's sort of gone in a more electronic direction. He's got a, a new record out. That's really great. Uh, not many new rock records, although I have, um, in the same way that you, you know, you've had my album for a couple of months now and you've been jamming on it and you want to say hey listen to this oh you can't i'm the same because i'm friends with lots of bands um i get sent records early and um records that aren't out and there's a couple that aren't out that i'm really jamming on that i can't tell you about sorry from from bands that i know well just um if i I think i'm allowed to say you know there's some records coming from bands that i know that haven't been announced yet, but are fucking excellent. So I can't tell you about them. I was just listening to Soul Waxes um, from Dewey, their most their latest record, because I had any minute now on in the car yesterday. And then I thought, oh, I'm going to give that other record a spin. They, the, the one they did a couple of years ago that was all one long track. I still can't really find my way into it, but I want to. You know, the, the will is there because I love Soul Wax so much. Um, so, yeah, that's what I've been listening to. A whole range of stuff. Soul right. Wax, man, I haven't mm-hmm. heard them for years. I remember seeing them when they did, um, they toured with too many DJs and everyone loved them. And they had the light up uh, microphone stands that were like big fluorescent tubes. Wow. And they yeah, were I couldn't... amazing. They, I, well, I went to see them when they toured Any Minute Now, their third record. And actually, I found them quite disappointing. I, uh, I think a lot of it was to do with the fact that they had a different drummer. Oh. He played all the drum beats slightly differently. And for a drummer, like, I'm a drummer, you know, I'm not a very good yeah. drummer, but I'm enough of a drummer in that the drums is what I sort of fixate on. And if the beats are so good like they are on those Soul Wax records, if you miss that fucking one ghost snare that I love in the fill or whatever, I, that was a real disappointment to me. So they put on a good show, but for me, for a nerdy drum boy at the back, I was a little bit cross at the drummer. Um, but yeah, I'd love to go and see him again. They're, they're great guys, real innovators. I've got a lot of respect for um, Soul Wax, yeah. And what have you got, like, I know at the moment you said you've only got download in your um, kind of calendar for next year, but writing-wise, because this album's already been done, I know it's going to be released soon, but you've had it done and recorded and finished. Yeah. What, what's your kind of writing head at now? Are you thinking you want to go back and do more of a concept album? Do you want to do more 
mellow stuff? Do you want to do another live album? Do you want to do another thing that I suggest and then you completely use it and rip it off and then put it out to the world? I've got, I've got lots, I've got lots of projects that I'm working on simultaneously and uh, I can, well, I can't safely say I'm fairly certain I won't put out a record next year that is longer than a single you know uh, right. uh, i'd like to i've got a couple of tunes that it would be nice to go out that sort of fit loosely with the sort of devolver shuffle king of clubs vibe but then beyond that i'm gonna make a i'd like to make a break and do something very different um and uh i can't say too much about what that is at the moment because it, it may mutate and it may change shape as i approach it but uh, I can say at the moment that I'm working on some stuff that is that is different to the last sort of three or four records I've made. Um, but then again, I'm working on lots of different records at any one time. There is there is one that I'm concentrating on at the moment, and then there's another that's just completely insane, and one that is I've actually invented a new form of music that I'm not ready to share with the world. <laughs> What one that'll come out at some point. My manager is a bit afraid of that one. And I've got another record that just sounds like I can't tell you, but I've got three or four albums I'm working on at the moment. And at any one time, they will shift in my brain to become the to become the one I'm focusing focusing on. Yeah. But what I can say is that I don't plan to release a long record next year. I think if I do release anything it'll be like, you know, a single at most. And I'd like to put some new music out, but I want to take time to concentrate and make sure that my next um, full length has had just enough time to stew, you know, and, and is its own thing and is separate. It, King of Clubs just sort of blurped out by accident. Like I say, it wasn't supposed to be happening. And I, I think I'm going to make a concerted effort next year to make sure no more accidents, no more um, surprise children. No. Uh, yeah, so a couple of singles maybe that I'm excited about. Some sessions booked in with some producers. Actually. We're talking about making some sounds. Uh, I, mean, I might be doing, I'll be doing a lot of recording next year, but I'm not sure how much of it anyone will hear because a lot of it will be tests to see what direction all this stuff is moving in. But I'm looking forward to playing a lot of gigs. So you might not hear a lot of new music from me, but hopefully you will hear a lot of loud gigs from me. That's my wish. And what about the creative side? Because I know you directed some of your old band's music videos. Yeah. And I still think you've got a movie in you. I still think there's either a short film or I, I can just see the way that your vision is, yeah. the way that you've handled stuff. And I just think to myself, one day he's going to put the guitar down and sit there and think, I want to make a film. I'd really like to. I wrote, I wrote a movie in lockdown. I started writing a movie. Uh, I started writing a, a Polish vampire film. Nice. Uh, <laughs> and I wrote the score and everything, but, uh, you know, I wrote the treatment out and it didn't make any sense. And I sent it to some people and they were like, this is gibberish. <laughs> so I'm going to keep working on that one. And I did think, cause when I met, um, Duncan Welloway, who directed, um, always crashing in the same car, which I then cannibalized for you're the boss on shuffle. Um, he'd been very helpful with that whole process, you know, Bagging and Paul McGann for me, for Christ's sake. And then at the Christmas show we did in London, just at the end of the shuffle door, he turned up. Wonderful guy. We, turns out we get on just as well in person. And so I'd like to do something with him, you know, and I thought when I had this idea for a film, maybe I'd tap up Duncan because I don't know anything about directing. Well, I, I know about directing uh, short music videos. And in fact, I did one for, apart from all the ones I've directed for King of Clubs in the summer, I did one for my friend's band, Man Down, directed a video for them, which I found a lot of fun and actually one of these records that i've been listening to that i can't tell you about i'm going to be directing a, a promo for one of them which i'm very excited about so i would yeah i'd like to do more directing as for a feature film it's always been a dream of mine and when i have the right story i'll do that yeah he says i'll just i'll do that <laughs> but it's got to be the right story first i'd love to make a film about vampires because since i was a kid I don't know if anyone knows this about me. I've been sort of obsessed with vampires. And I actually, I really love those Anne Rice vampire books. And I love um, the Underworld vampire films. I know not many of them are very good. And I quite like the Blade films. I don't like the Twilight films. But mm -hmm. vampires in general are fascinating. And if you hear all the 
weird folklore surrounding vampires, especially in Europe. There's a great book called The Vampire in Europe, which is a um, forensic scientific study of uh, vampire sightings and instances and folklore. It's crazy. The whole vampire, it goes way beyond like the steak through the heart and the garlic and everything. And I wanted to make a a film about that side of it, the more sort of, dare we say it, realistic European experience of vampires in in the time before science. So that's a passion project that I'll be, God, I really spilled the beans here, but yeah, I'm writing a film about vampires. Sorry. Can it be a bit like Let the Right One In? Because that's one of my favourite films ever. I need to watch that again. I really liked it. Yeah, um, sure. I mean, I don't know what form it's going to take, but it will will treat it seriously and with, um, you know, realism. Not that I've got anything against. I loved... um, what we do in the shadows the movie yeah. uh, i thought that's great very funny and, and well done at poking fun at all the tropes uh, whilst again being serious taika's character had a very um serious art didn't he in that film i haven't watched the series so i don't really I know everyone worships at the, at the feet of matt berry but he's not for me um so i, I like to keep i'm just going to keep the film and not watch the series i know it sounds silly but I no it's, uh, i understand but everyone says it's really good and i'm like oh i don't know if i can tarnish the film yeah, but- the general rule is if everyone says it's really good, stay away. That's what I do. More <laughs> yeah. than two people tell me it's really good. I just will never watch it. But everyone's so. saying that about your new album. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Fuck. I just I won't listen to it ever again then. <laughs> Fine. And a question that um, I ask everyone now. So recently we've had lots of different guests on. I've had like Alex Winter. We had Bill and Ted, which was ace. You are joking. Alex Winter is fucking great. He's yeah. amazing. An amazing physical comedian. Did you watch um, his show, what, Idiot Box? No. Oh, man. Idiot Box. And have you seen um, Freaked? No. You, I thought you did research, man. Listen, bet Alex Winter's best stuff is not Bill and Ted. Alex Winter's best stuff is a TV show he did for MTV. It's sort of like Beavers and Butthead. We're like connecting skits between music videos. Right. Called Idiot Box, I'm fairly sure. Uh, or TV Box or TV Idiot. I don't know. I watched them all. And then his own film, Freaked, which was sort of the movie version of Idiot Box. Um, and it's got Keanu in it as well, as a very heavily disguised role as, a, as Ortiz, the dog boy. No. But man, if you like Alex Winter, check out, freaked for sure and if you can find idiot box on youtube do that because he is such his own comedy voice is different from bill and ted and he puts you can see sort of bits of his physical um comedy he's a great physical performer in what he's doing in bill and ted but he's really he's playing a character where whereas when he's got free reign in freaks and um idiot box he deserves to be as big a name as any of our beloved you know physical comedians none of whom I can think of at the moment, but he's a real, he, he's his own thing. He's great, Alex Winters. Wow. Sorry, I went off on one there. No, it's good. Um, he's the best thing in the new Bill and Ted film. He's absolutely awesome. Uh, I'm not going to go and see that. It, uh, um, uh, it makes me sad. The trailer just looks so lame. And then when I found out that Weezer were in it, I was like, nah, do you know what? <laughs> no, this is not for me. Um, I'm out. That's a shame. It is a shame. But... Anyway, if people like Alex Winter that have been on recently and all this, I've asked them advice for people that want to get into the industry. Now, obviously, yeah. he hasn't acted for years. He's been doing stuff behind the scenes and producing and directing. You've been playing and writing music for years, and there are a lot of people out there that want to be in a band, that want to pick up guitar, want to have their song on Spotify. What advice do you give to people right now that are trying to make a name for themselves in an industry that's getting tougher and tougher? The advice I would give is don't try to make a name for yourself. Try to make good music and then the name will come with that. The, uh, I mean, I know that's just how you phrased it and that's probably not what you meant, but that it, it's a good point to make is that yeah. that is a mistake that a lot of people make as they try and make a name for themselves and they try and get famous, which is the wrong way to go about it. Says someone who has neither achieved fame nor a name for himself. But uh, I hope I've made some good music. Uh, you re- that's really as simple as it is. Focus on the music. Don't focus on the fancy clothes or a fun stage act or a cool rock star name. Just focus on the music. And then if you're doing it right, the rest will happen. 
and um, take chances, say yes. Uh, that's all I can really say is, and, and try to be honest, crucially try to be honest. Does that make, does that make any sense? Definitely. Uh, okay. like you, like you said, I didn't mean it in a way of like, Hey, how do you want to make a name for yourself? But they just want to I get, know, I didn't that. mean it clinically, yeah. but yeah, I think a lot of people come at it from the wrong angle, which is, which is crucial. And last time you were on, my final question was, what did you want as the outro music? Because, uh, exclusively to Mark and me, every piece of music that's the outro to the podcast is chosen by the guest. And you chose Ingerica. Did I? That was nice of me. So wow. now we're going to put you on the spot and we're going to ask who you want this time round for part two. Well, let's have, seeing as I chose Ingerica last time, let's choose um, DLP by Bait. Um, who is the remaining side project of one of the members of Ingerica, Mike Webster, who yeah. is the bass player of Ingerica. His new project is Bait, which is sort of a band, but sort of his thing, a bit like Nine Inch Snails. You know, he's got a group of musicians, but he's the, he's the ringleader. And really great single came out last year, super aggressive and dabbling with electronics and I just love um I love his lyrics I love his del delivery I love everything about him you know I love him as a person um we went down to South End as soon as the restrictions eased up well not as soon as we waited to see if everyone would die yeah. <laughs> when they said we could meet another household outside we waited to see if everyone would die and when and then when no one died we went and stayed outside in a fucking gale force wind uh, <laughs> in their garden for a distance barbecue with everyone at one <laughs> corner of the garden being blown about uh, with the Websters. And that was wonderful to see them. So yeah, play DLP by Bait, spoke B-A-I-T. And uh, that's their latest single. And, and see how you feel about that as a little continuation. And the next time I'll play you his next project and which goes through the Let's evolution. Let's do it until he retires. Yeah. That's awesome. Thank you, Jamie, for coming back on. There's not many guests that I've had back on at the moment. I've uh, tried to keep it nice and fresh, but I just thought there's got a couple of people that have come back on, but I think, yeah, apart from Dustin from Fry's, I think you're the first guest that's come back on. I'm honoured. I'm honoured. Get Very Tony good. Hopkins back. Call him up. He'll come back one. If you When you talk to him, give him props from his big fan, Jamie Lemon. Yeah. You know? I appreciate you coming back on, dude. It's a, a play. I do want to do a third part. I want to come back to the house. It felt, this is great and I loved it, but I love the just relax and just sit with microphones and not, you know, I just prefer it. Sure. Well, I'm, you know, maybe after I've done my next uh, surprising project, we can, we yeah. can come back and you can say, well, it all went to shit. And I'm like, yeah, sorry. And I'm like, you fucking quoted me on the poster and everyone said it's your worst album of all time. And I said it's better than race car. Could you not? It's going on the poster. It's going on the poster. Yeah. That's awesome. Thanks for your kind words about the record. It really, you know, it really means a lot. All right, dude. Have a good rest of the day and I'll catch up with you soon. You too. Bye for now, buddy. So there it is. There's my interview with me and the incredible Jamie Lemon talking all about his brand new album, King of Clubs. And as I said on the start of today's podcast, I can't big this album up enough. It's available now on Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon Music and easily my album of the year. If you've loved it and listened to it because of this podcast, jump onto social media and let Jamie know. I'm sure he'll absolutely love seeing the positive feedback. And hey, if you love the podcast, jump onto markandme.com. On there, there's links to my Facebook page, my Twitter page, Instagram and email. I read every single message you send and I respond personally to each and every tweet or Facebook comment. It really does mean a lot. On there as well is my link to my Patreon page. You can support the podcast from as little as a pound a month. For that, you get two episodes a week at the moment, which is absolutely insane. Also on top of that, there's the opportunity to win some amazing prizes. And at the moment, we've got some incredible badges from Digital Suicide, some amazing t-shirts from Last Exit to Nowhere, Funko Pops, but also some absolutely incredible prints that are coming out. I can't reveal right now who they're by because it will ruin the surprise of the guests that are coming up, but they are literally prints that money can't buy. Thanks again for everyone that's tuned into the podcast today. I really hope you've enjoyed it. I'll be back again in a few days' time with a brand new episode. So until then, listen to Jamie Lebman, stay safe, and I'll speak to you then.